You'll want to turn to uh, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. First Timothy, that's in the New Testament. What's that? Last time I checked. How many of y'all are here this morning? Raise your hand. Okay. I'm not sure about that. Is this a trick question? He's up to it again. It's good to be here. Yes. God bless for being a part here. Those of y'all are in this room. Those of y'all are a bunch of outside and over here and online. So we're uh, grateful you're here this morning. Um, I've been preparing this message for a long time, which means it's going to be a long sermon. Long time, long sermons. They go hand in hand. Uh, yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> You know, at First Timothy, let me kind of explain the history here. The early Christians were, were looked upon as uh, some sort of, you know, uh, treason against Caesar, Rome. And uh, they weren't. They just knew that they worshiped God above Caesar. And there was a conflict of interest here, right? And so in this conflict of interest, the author here is just reminding the people of how we are to pray, our responsibility. And as we go into this election, uh, this is what we're going to be talking about this morning. Uh, the title of the message is, How Should I Vote? Anybody getting nervous here? Yeah? Okay. All right. You'll get over it. And uh, what, what is encouragement with this verse is, is that, uh, that clearly for believers, we're not to pray to someone, but we're to pray for them. And this is what the author Timothy is really outlining here, that we are accountable as citizens to pray for our leaders. Amen? And I'm going to tell you about, we're going to meet Tuesday morning at 9 o'clock here just to pray. We're going to be at 30-minute prayer time. There may be donuts involved just to get your attention with this. But uh, we're just going to pray for the election of, uh, of uh, this event on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. So if you can hang out here for 30 minutes, you want to come early, the church doors will be open during the day for you just to come and to pray God's perfect will be done. Amen? Amen. We're going to pray that. We're going to pray that. You all agree we need prayer this week, don't you? Yes. This is an important time. It really is. Never in the history that I've seen as a pastor the, the influence and the directiveness as we as a church must pray for this election. And so we're going to be a part of that. So we're going to be talking about how should I vote. Let's read this first. Anybody want to read uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 for me? First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior. Who wants everyone to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Amen. Even politicians to be saved, right? <laughs> Did y'all get that? <laughs> That's exactly what I mean. Everybody kind of tired of all uh, the political ads and, and all this. Y'all getting worn out by this? I'm exhausted. I'm exhausted. In fact, even the word politician is kind of a... Uh, a negative word nowadays, isn't it? I heard this story about a farmer who was just plowing his cornfield, and he heard this unbelievable noise and crash, and he runs over there, and there's a bus full of politicians that had crashed in his cornfield. They were just laying everywhere. He looked at them. He buried every single one of them. The police came. Easy now. You're in ahead of me. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can just stop right there. Yeah, he buried them. Yeah. Now, he buried them, and, and the, the authorities came later, and they said, what happened? He said, man, this bus full of politicians laying in my cornfield. They were strewed everywhere, so I buried all of them. And the policeman asked, he said, were they dead? He said, well, some of them said they weren't, but we all know politicians lie. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I'm, uh, I've stayed away from politics all my life. I really have. And uh, I find myself being, being just almost pulled into this. Not, and I've, 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 I've scratched and I've clawed and I just, you know, just kind of stayed away from this. And I'll tell you why. I've never in, endorsed, publicly endorsed a uh, person uh, ever. 
I'm not going to this morning. But rather than endorsing a political figure or political policy, I believe there ought to be an endorsement of biblical teaching and the Word of God. Amen? And that takes precedent. Listen, church, that takes precedent over everything. You know, 150 years ago, if you're, if you're a student of American history, you'll notice that churches and pastors and, and Christian leadership was heavily involved in community and American uh, government. Did y'all know that? It's very clear they were. And now, so we've kind of made this separation, I think, is the falsehood. We won't get into that this morning. But uh, um, um, we've just kind of separated ourselves. And so I read a lot of articles concerning this. I read one about a couple of weeks says, you know, politics in the pulpit. And one article says, no, 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 because a sermon ought to be greater than just politics. In other words, talk about sin, conviction of sins, and man's salvation, the righteousness of God, how do we live a life? And then the piggyback article was, yes, because God loves our nation and he's concerned about everything he is isn't he? and the bible says a lot of things about politics a lot of things about government a lot of things that we ought to be aware of in our nation so i think the bottom line that i want you to hear very clearly this morning is this is that our as believers and followers in the body of christ our utmost allegiance and devotion is to god and god first amen that is our directiveness and that's our allegiance above any political platform, any personality of somebody we like or we don't like above or whether or not who we vote for or we don't vote for, our allegiance must be as believers and followers of the kingdom of God. This is not our kingdom, but we're part of the kingdom of God and that's our priority, amen? And that is our objective here as we look at this and we dive into things. So make sure you fully understand where I'm going with this because let me tell you, this has been a tough year for church, hasn't it? It's been a tough year for pastors. I mean, it's, you know, do, do we have church or do we not have church? Do we really embrace the pandemic, which I, I think we should, or we don't? Or, or how do we handle all this? And so a buddy of mine that I led to the Lord uh, uh, his senior year in high school, he's a pastor of a church, and uh, he sent this to me. And I love what it says here, so bear with me. It's kind of lengthy, but I, I really want you to understand just the dilemma that I've been facing preaching this sermon because it's something I've never done before. And here he is. He said, do you ever wonder what it's like to be a pastor? I'm not talking about the honeymoon stage, but a couple of years into ministry, do you, I wonder how many people really understand what it is to be a pastor. Here's what you'll discover if you become one. If you're a person of strong convictions, some will say to you, you're overbearing, and you should back off, quit trying to push your beliefs on others. And if you don't take a strong stand and position of things, some will say you're wishy-washy, people pleaser, even a coward. And if you're a strong leader, some will say you're a dictator, controller, or something worse. I had that happen a lot to me. If you don't take a strong lead, some will say you don't have vision for a direction where the church should be going. You're just marking time or just making a paycheck. If you stop public gathering for a time due to a pandemic. Some will say you're not a man of faith. You're only acting in the flesh. And if you don't stop public gathering for a time of this pandemic, some will say you have no concern for the safety of people. All you care about is your own ego and having people come hear you speak. If you never speak on social issues and political things, some people will say you have stuck your head in the sand and you're not lending your voice to real issues that affect all of us. We need to have spiritual leaders who speak up. But if you do speak up on those issues, some will say to you, just keep quiet about those things. Stick to your teaching the Bible. Leave all that stuff to the politicians and to those other people, because by the way, pastors aren't people anyway. Hmm. Don't try to use your voice to influence people in one way or the other. Honestly, folks, Pastors can go through a day to be congratulated and praised and encouraged for doing something or saying something. And on that same day, on that same reason, on those same words, can be called names and have people walk away from them. Some days pastors walk through the day thinking, am I in the twilight zone? No, you're in ministry. <laughs> it's no wonder 
that only one out of 10 ministers who graduate from seminary ever retire in ministry. One out of 10. And why is that? It's tough. It's tough. So this morning, I'm not whining at all. I'm so grateful. I am really grateful to be a pastor and a minister these years. I've seen some most incredible things of God, but it has been a tough, tough year. I, I want to say some things just straight up. Brenda's out, out there. I'm going to wave to Brenda. Brenda's been writing down some of my, my Garyisms, is what she calls it. You know, just some of the things I've said and some, and she's got a whole list. She's going to put it in book. It's going to be offered for $29.99 for y'all. No, I don't know that. She's been putting them together. And here's some things that my Garyisms that I just want to share with you before we begin to dive into this serious and difficult topic. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How's that work now? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh. Anybody else want to take a shot? One hour. Yeah, one. Uh. Oh, yeah. Am I turning red? I am. Uh. Anyway. <laughs> I hear him laughing out there. <laughs> Here's some Garyisms. The pulpit should never be used to settle arguments. Listen to me. Pulpit should never be used to settle arguments. In other words, a pulpit is where the gospel is proclaimed, not partisanism policies explained. Amen? This isn't a place to argue and try to convince you. I'm not here to convince anyone here. Do you understand that? I'm not here to do that today. I'm here to speak truth and let truth be evidence of its own argument, rightly dividing. Yes. Second thing, political revision is never a substitute for spiritual revival. So if we can just get the right guy in there, our spiritual growth will be, it's not true. Listen, in other words, this is not a political problem, but it is a spiritual plight. That's our problem. Do you understand that? Yeah. We have to be accountable for what's going on in our nation. We cannot throw stones in any other direction than look in our own heart. And that's what we're going to do today. Amen? I want to remind you of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, where we've been on this spiritual journey of uh, spiritual warfare. And I just want to make sure we understand that where we're dealing with, it's not uh, political positions, it's not individuals, it's not uh, one party versus a not another party, or right or left, or any of those things. We have been looking at spiritual warfare. We do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood political parties, political individuals, but we wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers, over this, over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of all evil in where? Where we've been looking at? In heavenly places. And I've been talking to about this fallout in this heavenly place, this second heaven of the warring angels and the demonic influence have been warring over that. And we're seeing the fallout here in, 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 in our lives. And this is what I think is going on. We also looked at uh, the last thing we looked at about the wisdom of God. We desperately need God's wisdom concerning this. Amen? Not our opinion, not what's comfortable to us, not what makes me happy or satisfied on this earth, but I need the wisdom of God. I want to give you a scripture verse that we read, and then we're going to dive into some more because I want to make sure we fully understand where we're going with this versus opinions when he God's wisdom. So that through the church, say through the church, it's through the body of Christ that this manifold of God's wisdom, this multifaceted, of, remember that word we looked at manifold, that, that multifaceted of God's wisdom. So we don't understand it all. And there's different layers of this, different aspects of this. As the Holy Spirit enlightens us, we see different aspects of God's character, but it's always His wisdom, His plan, His device, and also His ruling. That through the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. And here's what that verse has said to us. I said, God has ordained and destined His glory, His wisdom, His design through the church. He's not going to send a bunch of angels. He's not, he's not going to do that again. It's through the church that God's wisdom, design, and purpose is revealed. And so when we look at our society today, we say, man, we don't see God's purpose. We're held responsible to reveal that and to illuminate that. We are ambassadors of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So how are we doing? How are we doing? 
What's our sp spiritual thermometer in our nation today? And who's to blame? Where we must look at? It's us to us. So much that even the principalities, you see that verse? Even the principalities and the rulers take note and stop this demonic influence when God's people illuminate the glory of God in us. Do you understand that? All of these, this war, that this invisible war that's going on stops and looks and says, man, these people know God and God is revealed in them. And that's how we vote according to what God says, according to how God leads us. His glory, His purpose, His design will be known. And then we looked at this last thing here. Well, we kind of stopped there. Now I want to give this next statement to Antichrist. We looked at the word Antichrist a lot because the Bible says that there are many Antichrists that are among us. The Antichrist is here. We're not talking about the final Antichrist, but we talked about the Spirit, exposing the Spirit. Remember y'all? Y'all with me on that? Y'all remember? Okay, eight of you. That's not bad. We're getting better here. Eight of you remember the spirit of the Antichrist, and there are many Antichrists. The word anti is this preposition in the Greek word that is kind of twofold. It means something that's against, you know, total, total against Christ. But it's also, and here's where it gets a little cloudy, a little difficult for us to understand this because we must be spiritually minded to see this, but it's in place of. Anti means in place of Christ, a substitute for Christ. In place of that. And we kind of looked at that uh, quite a bit uh, over this. Now, let me tell you, biblical history clearly illustrates that, that Satan has a tactic. And his tactic is to oppose, to kill, to destroy, and replace God's glory. And that same agenda is the same agenda that we look in the Old Testament that we see that is being followed out today. Solomon says it this way. He says, what has been done in the past will be done in the past. And what is being done now has already been done in the past. And then he says this, Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. Do you understand that? So Satan's tactic that we see in the Bible is the same tactic that he has on this word, and that is to steal and to kill and to destroy and to dismantle and to have the glory of people and angels be given to him and not to God. And that's his plan. We see this in our history. In our government, it's very clearly deceived. I have a statement here about, y'all know who Karl Marx, y'all understand who Karl Marx, let me give you the statement that he says, huh? All right. 18 what? Really? I didn't know that. But here's what Karl Marx said, he was uh, in his um, proclamation to, um, well, we know Marxism, but it's his declaration of communism, his manifesto. And this came from his manifesto of communism. It says, his religion is a sigh of the oppressed creature, like <sighs> the heart of the heartless world and the soul of the soulless condition. It is the opium of the people, just a drug. Yeah, that's what he said. His whole intention was to remove God. And to remove capitalism, in other words, self, self, you know, worth really is what that is. That was his whole goal of that. And we've seen that, that spirit manifest itself so many different ways, this antichrist. To remove God, that was his purpose, to remove God. And we've seen this. We see this in the uh, uh, Bolshevik resolution uh, uh, led by uh, Lenin in Russia in the early uh, 1900s. We saw that. We've seen this in the National Socialism uh, takeover of Hitler in 1937 in Germany. We've seen this recently in Communist Revolution in China under, under Xing Dong in, in uh, 19, uh, 1947. And we see this same spirit of, of removing God causing crisis and government salvation of the oppression and the, uh, and the destruction and the, through chaoticness. And we notice this in, in Israel. We see this a lot. You remember Israel, when, when, they, were, when they had left exile and they left the exodus and they left um, uh, Egypt, you remember seeing on that journey, when they're on this journey, they look back and they see the chaoticness of, of the enemy coming against them. And what did they say? Let's just go back. Let's, let's go back to our way of life because at least 
we, we were safe there. We were enslavement, but at least we're safe there. And it's, it's in this crisis that God exposes our hearts. Are we really going to serve Him and follow Him? Are we just going to depend on the world to bring some sense of satisfaction and some, some sense of security? And so we see the Israel in the... Again, these are God's people, by the way, right? Y'all with me? Right. And so God's people, we find themselves in the wilderness, headed to the promised land, to purpose that God has designed for them to bring glory to Him, right? But in this process, they run out of food. And so they get, let's just go back home. We ran out of water. Let's just go back home. They finally get to the promised land. They see these big guys and their little guys. And they come back and say, we can't win this. Let's just go back home. Do you see this? Crisis after crisis after crisis exposes hearts. You all know that, right? Okay. And so that's what's been happening in America. Just complete exposure of our hearts to remove God. Cause crisis. I think in our America today, I've never seen this before. Shut down economy, have y'all ever seen this before? You know, for, for our government to say, out of 35 million people, your job is not essential to deem that? Who would ever think of that? And for even some states to even look at churches and say, you're not essential. You need to shut your doors, no more, no more gathering together. Have you, can y'all believe this would ever happen to America? Never in a million years would you. What is this about? And what should our concern be? And what's, what, what, what is when our government tells 35 million people that your job is not essential? And should we be alarmed by all this? Yes, please. Yeah. Pattern and practice, case law, is, is, a, is a weird thing there. Pattern and practice case law is something that once you go against the grain or once something you begin to practice something that maybe is a little not sure in, in rules in our constitution, if you do it long enough, then it becomes kind of a case law and you can use that against somebody or for somebody. Where there's discrimination, it comes in many different ways. And what is happening here is that we see this more and more, just a, a leniency on the Constitution. Some people say, we need to reimagine our Constitution. We need to rethink this. What? Yeah. And so, so we see this struggle here. We, we're reminded here. So let me just, can I remind you of something we're at? Let me give you some good news. Some of y'all go, well, I'm in the press, you know. Let me just remind you that we are a nation who celebrates faith. Do you know that? We are a nation that embraces faith. From the very beginning, our forefathers said, we're going to embrace faith. You can have faith or don't have faith. We still celebrate faith. Do you know that? You're protected if you say, I, I, I don't want to have faith. I'm, I'm agnostic. I'm, uh, you know, I'm an atheist. Our Constitution protects you of that. And by the way, if you came to me and said, I want to start a commune of, of atheists in this group. No, none of y'all are going to do that. But somebody said, I want to start a commune of atheists. I'm going to do this. I'd say, go do it. Because we have a freedom to do whatever we want to express in our faith. Right? You understand that? I know we struggle with that. But that's just, we celebrate that. And I stand with that. I'm not going to pay for it. <laughs> yeah, did you hear that? I'm not going to pay for it. And neither should our government pay for it. But you can go start a commune. You can share whatever you want to share. Go do that. We celebrate that. We celebrate faith in our nation. We celebrate if you have faith or if you don't have faith. In fact, our very first, our very first amendment says a freedom of religion, right? We celebrate that. We also celebrate the fact that Article 6 of our Constitution says that, that you will not be judged according to your faith to hold public office or even to vote. And, 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 and you remember that case law that I mentioned a while ago? We saw this, how Amy Barrett was attacked about her faith. We have to be careful with that. There's, there's no place for that. There's protection. Article 6 of the Constitution says you cannot be judged by your faith. So, so I think we want to be careful with what, where we're going with this. I just want to mention these things and, and just to make sure we're on the same page. So let me get back to where I really want to say, how should we vote them? You know, voting, I, I, I think voting is, is at the heart of democracy. Would you not agree? 
I mean, it really is. It's at the heart of democracy that, that we have this wonderful opportunity every four years to elect our, our uh, commander in chief. Every four years, we're given this, this wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, privilege, I think. I don't think it's a right, because rights are intangible. In other words, intangible means you don't earn it. You know, like the right to speak, the right to life, right to liberty. We have those rights that are just given to you, but, but the privilege is tangible. We have to earn that. You have to be a law-abiding citizen, right? You're, it's removed. So I think voting is, is, is a privilege in, in our country. And we have this, uh, this wonderful opportunity every four years. Now, let me tell you what I'm about to tell you. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to tell you what group I think is better. Um, you know why? The law prohibits me to do that. Do you know that? It says that any organization that's nonprofit is registered in our government with the federal, you know, IRS, Internal Revenue, we're not allowed as pastors to publicly support, to, to tell church members how to vote, and to give money to that because it jeopardizes us being a nonprofit organization. Do you understand that? Did, did y'all know this? Okay. You do? I just told you. Yeah, you know it. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting, though, Planned Parenthood, nonprofit organization. They give $35 million in Forbes magazine, April 2020, said they plan to give $35 million to candidates who are promoting abortion. They're a nonprofit organization, but they also are federal funded. So because they're federal funded, they're allowed to promote and to give money to those that promote their agenda. There's something wrong there. There's something wrong there. Side note there. Some of y'all walked in this morning and said, boy, we're getting more than we bargained for here. Um, so I'm just, I'm just, let me clear the tension. <laughs> How many, if y'all, if y'all been here, I've preached over a thousand sermons from this podium over the years. Yeah, I had hair before I started preaching here. <laughs> I was a lot taller. <laughs> Prettier too, yeah. <laughs> Y'all know me. I am biblically based, and I'm a conservative. And I vote biblically based and conservative. And I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I will tell you, you have to trust me who I am. You don't have to, I'm not trying to convince anybody in this room, that's not my job. You understand? I'm not trying to convince anybody but I want to lay out three biblical principles on how you should vote. And the first one is, we're to pray. This is the most important thing we can do, is to pray. I really believe that with all my heart. Franklin Graham, four years ago, met at every state capital and led thousands and thousands of people in prayer. He met at every state capital. Do you know there were thousands of people that trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Just a few weeks ago, we saw the prayer march. Franklin Graham orchestrated that. There were tens of thousands of people who marched, and I watched this on television, just people in these what I called holy huddles, praying with one and holding hands and just, just crying out to God for that. There was 3.8 million people that watched this online, and I was one of them. I mean, some of y'all were too. Some of y'all rushed home to go watch this. And, and so it was a wonderful movement of God. You know what I believe came out of that? One of the greatest peace between Israel and Sudan has ever happened was orchestrated, I believe, because of that peace movement. Y'all know, know about that, don't you? You know? It wasn't because any political figure did it. I believe it was because God's people prayed for that. We also have somebody that is nominated and now confirmed in, in our Supreme Court because people were praying of somebody who, has a cons somebody who has a voice that represents those who believe biblical principles that are now in the Supreme Court. I really, really believe that. Forget about political offenses. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about biblical principles. You understand? Okay? Y'all with me? I'm not 
not talking political platform here. I'm talking about biblical principle that, that uh, Amy Barrett embraces about the sanctity of life. And so we ought to pray about this. Let me give you that verse. Let me just verse 2 there, Joe. Notice for, for kings and for all in high positions that we may lead in peaceful, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Boy, I just long for that quiet life again, don't you? That peaceful life in our, in our country. Notice this, so we're praying for government leaders. We're not just to pray about an outcome, but we're to pray for the leadership and the guidance that they get, that God's will will be done. Abraham Lincoln says this. Check this out. I've been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. My own wisdom and that of all about me seems insufficient for that day. Abraham Lincoln, a prayer warrior. George Washington said this quote, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. Sun Chronicles 714 says this. Let's say this together, right? If my people, come on. Who's in charge? God's in charge. God's in charge with this. I want to invite you Tuesday morning, 9 o'clock right here. Let's just come pray for a while. 9 o'clock, Tuesday morning. Secondly, we're to prepare. We're to prepare. A study in, in Pew Forum on Religion, religion and, and uh, Public Life said this, that two-thirds, two-thirds of American say their faith has little to do with how and who they vote for. Two-thirds of Americans has little to do with their faith. And, and uh, instead, most of us vote, most of us vote for what helps me the most. How this individual is going to cut taxes. How many jobs are they going to supposedly give? Better jobs. Health care. So that my life will be better. And that's what we're voting. Some of you are saying, well, yeah, I get that. That's who we should vote. We ought to vote for somebody that's going to protect us and, and promote my well-being and give me a better job and, and make sure that, that, I, that there's social security out there for me and I have my health care and all that. And that's right, Pastor. That's how we ought to vote. It's not. It's not. It's not. There's a greater issue for us as believers. Do you know this? And the greater issue is what does God say? And who does God say? And that is the man that's on our life. We're held accountable to him. Not about my well-being on this earth because he's going to take care of me no matter what happens on this earth. So often we get caught up with this. And I, I, you know, I'm going to give you another Garyism. How's this? Here it is. Look at this. Vote according to biblical principles, not from personal privilege pat platform. Do I hear that? I know some of you are going to chill and then, yeah, whatever. I get that. I'm not here to convince anyone here. I'm just here for, to present some truth here for us to be opened up to the Spirit of God to direct us no matter what. Do I hear that? Just recently we got the PPP, you know, the uh, payroll protection plan. That's that's my PPP, pastoral <laughs> privilege, you know, my, our pastoral protection plan that I give to you. We ought to be voting according to biblical principles. That's our mandate. Do y'all hear me? That's our mandate above everything else about how I feel, what I think, or how much this person can provide more for me. I'm going to vote for him because he's going he's to be my fighter for me. Uh -uh, God is my refuge. God is my strength. God is my source. He is, he is still the King of kings and Lord of lords over everything in my life, and I submit to him. And so biblical principles are the mandate, not a political platform. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. So there's some things in the Bible that cause me to be prepared with this. And not to be just ignorant. I think we ought to be prepared with this. I'll have an online uh, uh, website that you can go to. I'll give it to you after, after church where you can go in and find out what, what, what candidates, what they believe, and what they promote here. You ought to be well informed. Can I ask you a question real quick? How many have voted already? Raise your hand. What? I mean, I'm going to quit talking now. You know what I mean? <laughs> 
Okay, can we pass the plate, man, and just go home? <laughs> Kathy, you're right. There I am. Yeah, anybody vote? I'm not going yeah, to anybody not vote. I've already voted. Twice. I already voted twice. <laughs> Y'all didn't hear that. Yeah. But, let me, let me give you some biblical principles. And, and this is, if y'all, if you really believe what I just said, should we, let me, let me just throw it out there. Did you vote according to biblical principles? And you can say, well, you know, no, 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 not your interpretation, but your biblical principles. There's some things that are key in it, the sanctity of life. Yeah? Go, Joe, throw that up there. Is that where I'm at? No, yeah, we're there. I'm already there. There you go. The sanctity of life. See, you know, the Bible clearly says how important life is that how precious it is. This is God's gift from Him. It's God's gift. He loves life, and it's, it's, it's so fragile. Life is so daggum fragile and so precious. It's a, it's a vapor, but, but God, God values life and the sanctity of life. And Jeremiah says this, I knew you. God's speaking here. Hey, Jeremiah, I knew you. That, that must have, can you imagine God speaking that to him and he speaks that to us? He, he knew Gary. He knew he knew me. Gary, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before I was a twinkle of my dad's eye. <laughs> he knew me. He knew me. No, seriously, he said, before you were born, I set you apart and I anointed you as my prophet to the nation. Isn't that cool? Yeah, we, we read this. And, and then in, in Psalms, look what it says there. Oh, yes, you shaped me. First inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. And I was sculptured from nothing into something. Isn't that good? This is what God thinks of us. And thinks of us in the womb. Proverbs 31 8 says, we're, we're speak for those who does not have a voice. And the one that does not have a voice are the unborn. They don't have a voice and we're held accountable to be the voice of those. Sanctity of life is a mandate of how we must vote. Secondly, marriage and family. God, you know, that was the first institution that God established. Was, was marriage and then family. Do you know how important that is? If God, is, God established it, didn't think I'll, think I'll have a bunch of kids now. You know, like I get married, you know, I'm that age. Get married. God instituted that. And how he talks about this. The, the, the preciousness of, of marriage and, and family and it's, it's between a, a man and a woman. And that's what it says. And Jesus says this in Matthew. He answers, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them what? Male. Yeah, male and female. And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become what? One flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, what? Don't pull about this union between a man and a woman. Don't pull apart this. This is what God has established. Our voting our thought process is a mandate to support what God says about marriage, the sanctity of marriage between a man and a woman. End of conversation, guys. Also about the poor. In fact, you know what I'm going to say also? You know what, what happens in the family filters to our nation? Do you all know that? Yes. Whatever happens in our families and is happening in our families happens in our nation. It filters there. Because that's that first institution. Government came later. First institution. So everything flows out of the family into our government. If we start looking at it that way, we begin to see some, some issues that we have to address and the support for those that are elected. The poor and the unjust and the immigrants. Um, speak up for those that cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get... Justice. I think, I think this speaks that we, we have to have just some leadership that would support how we are to mandate those that are poor and those that, that are immigrants, by the way, too, by the way. You hear me? 
and, and, and the Bible cuts across the grain of both parties against the most political persuasions, doesn't it? You know, in Jesus' day, there are two political parties, you know that? The Sadducees and the Pharisees. And Jesus had conflict with every one of them, and he criticized both of them. <laughs> so if there's any consolation here, you know, I think sometimes we, we feel that way. Sometimes, you know, we vote for the, the lesser of the two evils, right? You know, we just, well, I'm not sure, you know, this and this, and I just vote. But let me tell you, whichever, the, the, the issue is not personalities or it is biblical principles that we choose to vote. Let me go to the last point, then we'll go home. You got to participate. Obviously, y'all have already voted. You know, you know, bad bad politicians are elected by good people who don't vote. <laughs> you ever think about that? Yeah, they don't vote. Yeah. So, so, you know that. Um, you know what? I, I read this the other day, and I don't know if that. It's kind of crazy stats on this. It said that 30 million Christians don't vote. Let me say it one more time. 30, 30 million Christians just go, well, what's the per? I don't know why. I'm just telling you. Don't, don't know why. I don't know why. Just, they just, 30 million people. And here's the interesting thing about this. You don't think, you don't think the Christian voice matters? Let me tell you the other stat to this. Do you know that in the last few elections, it's been less than two millions that has decided who's going to be our elected official. So you tell me now if Christian voice doesn't matter. It matters here, guys. It matters. Less than two million difference between who was elected and who wasn't. John, John Jay was the first chief justice uh, of a Supreme Court. Here's what he says. Providence has given to our people the choice of their ruler. And it is the duty as well as the privilege and the interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. You have a choice. You have a choice. Samuel Adams, he was a, a founder, uh, you know, founder and father of our country. He said this, let every citizen remember at the moment he is offering his vote that he is not making a present or a compliment to please an individual or at least that he ought to not so to do but that he is executing one of the most solemn trust in human society for which he is accountable to God and to this country. Well, isn't that a great statement here? Yes. Isn't that a great statement? Let me tell you this also. Don't be discouraged after Tuesday, no matter what. Right. No matter or not. Don't be discouraged. Because God is on His throne. Romans chapter 13, verse 1. Jack, you want to read that verse to us? He mentioned that today. He said, you're going to use Romans 13? I said, yeah. So, Jack, read that to us, please. Everyone must submit to the government authorities for all authorities come from God and those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. See, see God's in control here. He's authority. Does God really care about all this? He does. He really does, guys. He really cares about it. The question is, do we? I mean, really. When all this is over and the death settles, I'm not sure where we're going to be. I don't know. I don't think any of us knows. We're living some difficult days here, and I don't have the answer, other than the fact that I know who is the King, and who is the Lord, and who rules over all of this stuff that's going on. And I trust Him more than I put my faith in the government. I do. I really do. It's, it's been a weary encumbrance and all of us feel the tension and there's just the pressure that's going on huh, on here and, and, and all this, this the, the rioting and, and all this. Here's what I want to do to you. I want to pray that God's will will be done. Amen? Amen? And we come to this place and just say, God, we want your perfect will to be done. But God, we want to return to you. But here's where it begins. It begins in my heart and begins in your heart today. Guys, it begins in us today. And we're just a little old church in the middle of nowhere, and we're safe pretty much. And we go, really? Really? 
I believe when, when two or more agree on something, we'll be done. And this is a big to-do list for God, right? But it, He's got this. And so we're going to believe this and we're going to trust Him, but we have to let this begin. Lord, I, Lord, I confess my sins before You. I repent from You. And, and it must begin my commitment to seeking first the kingdom of God. And the Bible is true. This last verse, Joe, I'll throw it up there. This last verse. It's true when we seek after Him. I don't, I don't know the reference there, Joe. You got No. Psalms? Do you have a Psalms? We don't have that one? Yeah. So, Psalms 33, 12. Blessed is the nation. There it is. Y'all got that. You got it on your socks? Are you kidding me? Well, that's a... <laughs> oh, only a Wimberley Christian Church has that ever happened in a million years. Not in a million years. Oh, my goodness, you know. Yeah, that, there it is. <laughs> Bless is the nation. Do you have the whole verse? All right, put the leg down. Put the leg down. <laughs> Let's read this together, shall we? Yes. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom He has shown. Amen? Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap. Man. Here we go. Amen. God bless you and God bless America. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we love you. We love you. We love you. We thank you in the name of Jesus of, that you're on the throne and you're, you are ruling over every aspect. And you look down and you see all these worrisome and tiresome. Lord, it's been a struggle here. You know that. Lord, I thank you that this great shaking has awakened, awakened the church. And the church is rising up and the church is coming in agreement that it's time to take a stand and to be accountable unto you. And that's what we've looked at today. We are held accountable unto you. And so, Lord, we considered that an opportunity that your glory and that your presence and that your domain and that your presence would be known in our lives. And we're faithful to serve you all the days of our life. Lord, blessed is the nation where whose God is the Lord. And we celebrate this and we pray for our country and this, this thing called the election and all those involved. May there be a resolvement and exposure of who is king and who is Lord over our nation. God, we cry out to you, God. We bind the stronghold that's been over America over the years of lies and deceptiveness. We bind him over the lives and hearts of those that will be serving our nation. And we loose the Holy Spirit to bring a great revival in our nation. Bring us together in the peace of God. We pray for the peace of Israel. And we thank you for that. We continue to pray for the peace of the United States of America, God. Establish your authority, first of all, in our hearts and lives today. Let that be a mandate as we vote and as we go out into our community. But Lord, when the dust settles, we will be confident in you and in you alone. No matter what happens, we're confident in in you. And so, Lord, we place our trust in our declaration today. We ask this in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, we pray. It's His name we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 All right.